Two weeks ago, I encouraged that when life seems unfair, that we should lean on the Lord. But some, they will choose not to lean on the Lord because they are of the belief that God is unfair. However, we know that God is more than fair because as we saw last week, God is both faithful and he is just. Yet some will still look around today at our world and they will ask if God is so good, if God is so faithful, then why does he allow for the world to be in the shape that is he, that it is in? In other words, why does God allow bad things to happen? Why does God not intervene? My response would be to ask a question of my own. I would ask, why do we not intervene? Why do we not do something about all of the bad that is in our world? Why do we allow the world to be in the condition? Why do we allow the world to be in the shape that it is in? You see, maybe, just maybe, the onus is on us to do something about all of the bad that we see in the world today. Asking why God allows bad things to happen, it is akin to questioning God's sovereignty. It is akin to questioning God's benevolence. This is questioning his rule. This is questioning his authority, along with questioning him being perfect. In order to answer the question first about God allowing bad things to happen, let us first take a trip back to the Garden of Eden. I want to I want us to take a look at something. I want to show you something here today so that we can have a bit of understanding here about the Lord and the opportunity that has been given to all of us. When God created mankind, he created us with the desire to dwell with his creation. Man was able to freely roam around in the garden with just one rule to keep. You see, just because they were living free in the garden, it did not mean that mankind, it did not mean that Adam and Eve, it did not mean that they did not have any rule to follow. Adam and Eve, we know, were instructed not to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You see, that is the thing about freedom. Freedom, it comes with rules. It comes with guidelines. It comes with instructions, don't it? You see, we must follow these rules if we desire to remain free. You know, think about our free society today. There are all kind of laws in our free society, and if what happens to break those laws, guess what? They ain't all that free anymore. Now, we know how the story went for Adam and Eve. As Eve freely rolled in the garden, the choice to be obedient or disobedient, it presented itself to her in the form of the fruit from the very tree that they were commanded, that they were instructed not to eat from. With Adam, the same choice it presented itself when Adam, or when Eve, gave him the fruit to eat. Again, we know the choice that they both made. It is the same choice that many make in our world today. Now, some will ask, if God is so perfect, if he is benevolent, why did he put the tree in the garden in the first place? The suggestion here is that if God did not want man to do bad, if God did not want man to do wrong, if God did not want man to sin, then he would not have put the tree in the garden in the first place. 
This very same reasoning it is used today, isn't it? If God does not want bad things to happen, then he would just snap his fingers and he would take away every opportunity for man to do wrong. Since it is October, I want to say to you today that God did not create us to be mindless zombies. In the garden, God presented Adam and Eve with the freedom of choice. Choice. To all of us today, we freely live in God's creation and we do as we please because God has given us the freedom of choice. God has given us the freedom to do so. So asking why God allows bad things to happen would be the same as asking, why does God allow for good things to happen in the world? God has given us the freedom of choice. He has given all of us, every single individual in the world, he has given us the freedom to choose how we live. God has given us the freedom to choose what we want to be in this world. As with Adam and Eve, we have been left with instructions by God while we live in this world. Figuratively, we can choose to either eat fruit from the forbidden tree, or we could choose not to eat the fruit from the forbidden tree. In other words, while we still yet live here in this world, we can choose to live right by being obedient to God's instructions, or we can choose to be disobedient by living disobediently and not by following God's instructions for all of mankind. The Lord still very much desires to dwell with mankind. In the book of Acts, Paul is recorded saying to the Greeks that the Lord made from one blood every nation of mankind to dwell on the earth in the hope that we might grope, that we might blindly feel for him and find him. God hopes that we choose him. God hopes that you today will choose him. Will you choose to feel for the Lord today? Will you choose God or will you choose something else is the question. This was a choice we can see was laid out to the children of Israel as well. Through Moses, the Lord said, I have set before you today life and good. Death and evil in that I command you today to love the Lord, your God to walk in his ways and to keep his commandments, statutes, and judgments that you may live and multiply. God could certainly take away the freedom he has given, but should the Lord choose to do so, we would be nothing in this world. We would be nothing but again, mindless zombies that is gracing this world with no freedom, with no choice to choose how we want to live in this world. You see, if God wanted to dwell with zombies, the Lord would have created us to be just that. God would have created zombies. So again, some will ask, why does God allow bad things to happen? And again, I tell you today, it is not that God allows bad things to happen, but more so that God allows us to live as we desire. God allows us to live with the freedom to choose how we want to live in this world. Will we be obedient to him or not? God has given all of us that choice. <laughs> so again, the onus is on us. The onus is on mankind today 
to choose how we will live in this world. So what this means for us is that if we want the world to be a fairer world, if we want the world to be a better place, the onus is on us to make it a better place. If we do not want evil in this world that we live in, guess what? The onus, again, it is on us to remove the evil out of this world. You see, God has given to us the instructions. God has not only given us the instructions, but the Lord has shown us the way to do right. So again, the onus is on us to move rather than relying on God to snap his fingers and to make the world a better place. The onus is on us to make this world a better place. I feel the biggest problem that prevents us from making the world a better place is mankind's refusal to acknowledge and to accept our responsibilities in making this world a better place. Listen to that again. We seem to have a problem in accepting our role and our responsibilities in making this world a better place. Our refusal to accept our responsibilities is why we see the world in the shape that it is in today with all of the hatred that we see in the world, with all of the ridiculous crimes that we see happening all around us, the bitterness, the lying, the nonsensical wars that we can see being fought in the world today, we stand responsible for all of it. We stand responsible for this cruel, cruel world that we live in today. You see, it is easier for mankind to put the blame on the sovereign and the benevolent God rather than accept the fact that we, mankind, are the reason for all of the bad that is present in our world today. People ask, why does God allow bad things to happen? Yet we, mankind, we refuse to do anything about it. Why? Why are we refusing to do anything about all of the wickedness that we can see in our world today? Why do we just stand by and say nothing about it? Why do we just stand by and let it happen on our watch? Even more is that some will blame the devil who again, I would say to you today, is another easy target to blame for evil being in the world. Yes, Satan is mankind's greatest adversary. Yes, he is the ruler of darkness. Yes, he is the father of sins. However, and I want you to hear this clearly, God has given us the ability to combat that old devil. Even over Satan, we must remember that we choose how we live in this world. We can choose to combat him or not. What will you choose? The onus, again, I tell you today, it is on us. The onus is on us to live by God's word to combat all the evil that is in our world. The onus is on us to live by God's word to combat Satan himself as well. Are you putting good or are you putting evil in the world today is what I would ask you. What are you dishing out? What are you putting in our world today? If you desire to put good in the world, what will you do about the bad that is currently present in the world? What will we do if we collectively, if we desire for there to be good in our world, what will we do? How will you handle all the wickedness that is present in our world today? In Paul's letter to the Philippians, we see Paul writing and we see him speaking about the mindset that can make the world a fairer place 
to those that desire to put some good in this old world of ours. They're in the second chapter of Philippians. If you look at the first through the fourth verse, you'll see that Paul, he speaks of a certain mindset. And there again, in those first four verses of this chapter, we'll see that the mindset that Paul is speaking of there is the mindset of unity. In other words, the mindset of togetherness is what we'll see Paul speaking about there. In order to achieve unity, we'll see in our key verses for today that Paul tells us to not let anything be done through selfish ambition or conceit. If, if you want togetherness, if you want unity in this world, Paul says, don't let anything be done through selfish ambition or conceit. I wish somebody would hear that today. If we want our community, if we want our society, if we want the world to be a better place, we should not let anything be done through selfish ambition. We should not let anything be done through conceit. You see, selfishness and conceitedness will cause one to have an extraordinarily high opinion of themselves. And I tell you today that having such an opinion of oneself, it is a trait that is very dangerous. It is dangerous for that individual and it is dangerous for all of those that happen to be around that individual as well. We know that these traits, that they are dangerous. We know that these traits, they are dangerous because they are at the forefront of a lot of the evilness that we see in our world today. We know that these traits are a danger because we can look back at the past and we can see that the selfish ambition of a few and the conceitedness of a few, we can see that how it had a great effect of all of those who live by them in the past. As we know, selfish ambition and conceit, they are character traits of the flesh. They are character traits of worldly living that leads to wickedness, that leads to sin. Those who are of the flesh, Paul said to the Galatians, he said that they will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. I mentioned earlier that many crimes have come because one regards their own life more than the life of others. Wars, again, they have been fought, and as we see today, are being fought because of selfish ambition. When we take a look at the history of mankind, we'll see the mistreatment of people, and that the mistreatment of people, again, is due to the conceitedness of some. Suppression and oppression, all things that are unfair in our world today, they have come from souls that are driven by conceitedness and their selfishness. We live in a world where those who highly regard themselves, they can live out, they can fulfill their dreams, but at the same time, they will stop and they will trample on the dreams of those that they believe are of lower or of no regard to them. Again, I say to you today, the onus is on us to not be that way. The onus is on us, mankind, to do better. There is no unity and there can be no unity if people continue to choose to live with a selfish and with a conceited mindset. We, if we desire to do better, if we desire for the world to be a better place, if we desire to bring good into, world, into the world, we must learn how to truly regard one another as equals we must learn to have a mindset of togetherness. We must learn to have a mindset of unity. 
again, dishonest it is on us and not just on the Lord, who we already know is benevolent, who we already know is both faithful and just. I tell you today that it is time for us to be faithful. It is time for us to be just. It is time for us to be more than fair to one another. Again, we will see here in our key verse for today that Paul says we should esteem. That is, we should highly regard one another. Paul says, notice there, in lowliness of mind, in humility, better than we regard ourselves. Can you do that? Can you regard someone else higher than you regard yourself. Think about that for a moment. So Paul there, he encourages us to not just look for out for our own self-interest, but to look out for the interest of those that are around us. And when I say those that are around us, I'm not talking about just your loved ones. I'm talking about the stranger as well. And again, I feel that I must ask today, can you do that? Are you capable of looking out for the interest of others higher than your own interests? Think about that for a moment. You say you want the world to be a better place. You say the world is unfair and you want the world to be fair. But are you capable of helping others to fill their dreams more than you desire to fulfill your own dreams. Can you do that? And I smile about that because I know that that's a struggle for everyone. I know somebody sitting there watching this right now or somebody sitting there listening to this right now saying, oh, I can do that, preacher. I can do that. Do you know what you're saying? Being able to help someone fulfill their dreams is something that is just so inconceivable in our world today. We weren't raised to do that. We were raised to, to live out our own dreams, weren't we? You see, I say this because we rarely put the interest of others before our own self-interest. Yet as inconceivable as this may seem to be, I tell you today that mankind has always had a higher calling to live for one another rather than just living for one own self. So again, I ask, do you desire for the world to be a fairer and a better place today? Are you capable of living for this higher calling? To show you what I mean by this higher calling, I want to go back one more time here to the garden. Again, in the garden, while Adam roamed in the garden and while he tended to it, the Lord, he did not leave Adam to do all of those things alone, did he? You know, I've already mentioned Eve here. So we know for a fact that God did not leave Adam alone in the garden. God said that it was not good for Adam to be alone in the garden. And so what did God do? God gave him in the King James version, it will say a help meet. In other versions, we are told in scripture that God gave Adam a helper, someone who could be his equal and that could help him. Mankind, I tell you today, we have that same ability to help one another. You know, mankind, we have the ability to multiply, don't we? We are in this world by ourselves, are we? I'm not standing here today by myself. There are other people that are in this room today, isn't it? Those who are watching, they can hear it. And those who are listening, they can hear you say, uh-huh. They may not see you nodding your heads, but they know that you're here. They know that you are present. We are in this world alone. We are here to help one another. To that point, we have Cain and Abel, the first siblings that are shown to us in Scripture. Cain and Abel, 
they were to also be there for the purpose of helping so that all of them could uplift one another. Yet again, we know how the story of Cain and Abel, we know how it played out, don't we? I remember something that my dad said to both me and my brother when we were little and we had been doing what brothers do. We had been fighting. And I can't tell you what we had been fighting about at that time when my dad said this to us. But what's important is what my dad had said to both me and my brother. And it is something that I believe we both took to heart. My dad said to us, you two are brothers. He said, you are to be there for each other. He said, you are to be there to help one another. And we are tag team, me and my brother. And I tell you again, this is a saying that has stuck with me throughout my life. And I believe it to be a saying that is true, not just in the case of me and my brother. But I believe that it is saying to be true for every single person that is walking this earth. We are brothers. We are sisters. We mankind, we should be esteeming each other rather than tearing one another down. We should not be beating up each other. We should not be fighting one another. We should be working together. We, mankind, we have a calling to be better rather than what we have become. And again, I say the onus is on us to be better. As believers, we know for a certainty that we have an even higher calling that we should be walking worthy of compared to walking in selfishness, compared to walking in conceitedness. As John wrote in his first epistle, the message that we have heard from the beginning is that we should love one another and that we should not be as Cain, who was of the wicked one and murdered his brother. Again, I tell you, we have a better calling than murdering one another. Because God is more than fair and his way is benevolent because his way is perfect and it is always good. We are encouraged by Paul there in the second chapter of Philippians and there in the fifth verse, we are encouraged by him to choose to let the mind of Christ be in us. If again, we desire for the world to be a better place, if we desire to do good. This is a thought that traces back to the Mosaic law. And again, we have even seen this in our recent Sunday school lessons as well. What I want to do here for a moment today, I want to take you to the book of Deuteronomy. I want to take a brief look here at the 15th chapter of Deuteronomy because I want to share with you a precedent that has been set when it comes to having a mindset for caring for all of those that are around you rather than living with a selfish and a conceited mindset. Let's focus on this mindset of unity, this mindset of togetherness here today. Let us see what it has the power to do. In Deuteronomy, in the 15th chapter, we'll see that the Lord instructed the children of Israel there in the seventh verse that if there was poor among them within any of the gates in their land, that they should not harden their hearts nor shut up their hands to them. Those who were poor. Look at that. They should not harden their hearts nor shut up their hands. We see that by these instructions, God was certainly encouraging the children of Israel to do what was right by others, to do what was good. Don't harden your hearts. Don't shut up your hands to others. Now, could the selfish and could the conceited heart do such a thing? I heard an uh-uh there. In scripture, 
the rich young ruler conceded that he would be unable to care for those that were around him. As he was unable to open his heart, he was unable to even open up his hands to help those that were around him. Everyone that was around him was in need. And the rich young ruler couldn't open up his heart, couldn't open up his hands to do so. The selfish and the conceited heart would struggle mightily to do such good. Again, the onus is on us to do better, to do right by one another. Again, to the children of Israel there in the 15th chapter of Deuteronomy and the 8th verse, the Lord instructed them to open their hand wide to the poor and willingly lend them sufficient for their need. They were to open their hand wide to the poor. Not saying give me, give me, give me to the poor, but giving of themselves to those that were in need. God again was highly encouraging the children of Israel to do good by being willing to give of themselves to those that were around them. I want you to understand that this giving, it was not just about the dollar bill. Dollars didn't exist back then. It wasn't about giving money, but about being able to help in any manner that one would be able to help in. I also want to note here from this passage of scripture from the 15th chapter of Deuteronomy there in the 10th verse that the Lord said that those who desire to do good should not have been grieved to do so in their hearts. Look at that. In other words, it should not have been a struggle for the children of Israel to do good by others. To those that did good in that same 10th verse there, we'll see that God said that he would bless them in all of their works. If they desired to do good, God said that he would bless their works. This to me, it certainly harkens to the idea that Paul spoke of when he encouraged the, the, the Corinthians and therefore us as well, since we have read the letter to the Corinthians to give as we desire in our hearts. Paul said to the Corinthians, he said that when you give of yourself, that you should not do so grudgingly or of necessity, because God loves a cheerful giver. In other words, you should genuinely desire to give rather than to be given of yourself out of some form of religion. You should be given again genuinely because you feel like giving of yourself. And again, I want you to understand, I ain't talking about the giving of a dollar bill. I'm talking about giving in any manner that you can give of yourself here. We're talking about unity here. We're talking about togetherness here. In this passage of scripture from Deuteronomy, God advised the children of Israel there in the 11th verse that the poor will never cease from the land. So God commanded them again there to open their hands wide to their brother, to open their hands wide there to the poor, and to open their hands wide to those that were in need. All we see there are people who were in need that was in the land that the children of Israel should have been willing to help them because they desired to do so. Helping all those around you with hands wide open, that is the higher calling in the way to answer such a calling. This answer is what can and will bring even more good into our world and make this world a better place. You see, there will always be someone in need, someone that will need your help. 
help that you will be able to provide. The question that we must answer today is this. Are you ready to accept the higher calling of putting good into the world today? Or will you be one of those that make excuses and say that God should just snap his fingers and make good be in the world today? Will you be one of those that say it is God's fault that there's bad in the world today? Or will you answer his call for you to do better and for you to bring good in the world? Are you not a child of God? Do you profess to believe in the Lord today? If you do so again, I tell you that the onus today, it is on us, especially the children of God. To the Galatians, Paul wrote, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all. Every chance you get to do good, I hope today that you will choose to do good. Every chance that you get today to do right by someone, I hope that you will choose to do right by them and not turn your head and be oblivious to them. You see, that's what the selfish, that's what the conceited person does. They they regard themselves so highly that they're oblivious to everyone that is around them. That is their biggest downfall. That is the biggest downfall that we see in our world today. As we see in the parable of talents, and we saw this in the parable of talents in my sermon last week, the Lord gives his gifts to us with the expectation that we will give back what we have received from him. That we will give back to all of those that are around us, that we will help them all of those that are in need. As the proverb says, he who has pity on the poor lends to the Lord and he, God will pay back what he, what we have given. I genuinely believe that when we put good into the world, we will receive good back in return. You see, this is why we ought not to grow weary in doing good, because there is a reward of good that we will reap. You see, actually, everyone will reap something, whether they do good or not. They will reap something to the Galatians. Paul wrote, he who sows to his flesh of the flesh reap corruption, but he who sows to the spirit will of the spirit reap corruption everlasting life. I desire everlasting life. I desire the good reaping, the good reward. And so I'm going to do my best to put good in the world, not out of religion, but because of my genuine faith that heaven is real, that God is real, and that I have an opportunity to be able to enter into those heavenly gates. Why is there bad in the world? There is bad in the world because, again, we have allowed it to be here. We haven't done anything about it. It is time for mankind to step up and fulfill this calling of doing better. Everybody can do that. As believers, I tell you today that we should be on the front lines of doing it. We should be on the front lines of doing better as we should be moving in our faith. And if we move in our faith today, we will be moving righteously in the benevolence of the Lord. We will be doing right. Paul encouraged Titus and again, therefore us as well. He encouraged us to live soberly. He encouraged us to live righteously. He encouraged us to live godly in this present age while speaking, while exhorting, while rebuking evil with all authority. Are you doing that today? If we want good to be in our world today, the onus is on us to speak, to exhort, and to rebuke 
evil with all authority that has been given to us by the Lord. No more standing by today. No more sitting down and waiting for God to snap his fingers. We have a responsibility to our calling. Let us accept our calling today. Let us lift a finger. Let us stand true to our calling is what I encourage you to do today. Amen. Amen. Amen.